Welcome to the Approach to ABGs Part 4. My name is Jason Wechter. This is the fourth and final presentation in this series. This presentation will cover the Delta Delta and the five different differential diagnoses that are required for acid base disturbances. A delta is the difference between two values, and usually it's how much a value changed compared to normal. For example, a PCO2 of 30 which has a normal value of 40, would represent a delta of 10. And there are important delta ratios in arterial blood gas analysis. The delta of x compared to the delta of y. And we learned some of this when we were looking at compensation. There's one more delta ratio that is diagnostically important, and that's what we're going to look at now. We've already looked at the delta PCO2 compared to the delta bicarb, and this is how we determined whether compensation was partial or full, and we're not going to talk about that anymore. What we are going to talk about is the delta bicarb versus the delta anion gap. This is also called the delta delta, or the delta gap, or the delta ratio. We're going to refer to it simply as the delta delta. If you have an anion gap metabolic acidosis, the bicarb will decrease and the anion gap will increase about equally. Remember, the bicarb is in the anion gap equation. So if your bicarb goes down by 10, the anion gap should go up by 10. For example, a bicarb of 19 means that you have a delta bicarb of 5 and an anion gap of 17 is a delta anion gap also of 5. And therefore the delta delta would be the difference between these two values which is 0. If we show this in a little table for a anion gap metabolic acidosis the bicarb goes down, the anion gap goes up, they do so equally, and therefore the delta delta is zero. What if there were two primary metabolic events? For example, it is possible to have an anion gap metabolic acidosis and a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis at the same time. Both of these processes will decrease the bicarb, but only the anion gap metabolic acidosis will increase the anion gap. Remember that with an anion gap metabolic acidosis, the bicarb goes down by the same amount that the anion gap goes up, so the delta delta is zero. With a non-anion gap, metabolic acidosis, the bicarb goes down, but the anion gap does not change. So the delta delta is a negative value. Both together, the bicarb is going to go down really far, and the anion gap is only going to go up by a little bit. So the delta delta is going to remain negative. In other words, the bicarb is going to be lower than expected. What about the combination of an anion gap metabolic acidosis and a metabolic alkalosis? One process will decrease the bicarb while the other process will increase the bicarb, but only the anion gap metabolic acidosis will increase the anion gap. With the metabolic alkalosis, the bicarb goes up, there is no change to the anion gap, and if you were to do a delta delta, the bicarb would be higher than the change in the anion gap since there is no change in the anion gap. Putting both the anion gap metabolic acidosis together with the metabolic alkalosis, the change in bicarb balance each other out so you could actually have a normal bicarb but you're going to have a persistent anion gap and so the delta delta will be increased or in other words the bicarb is going to be higher than you would expect given the fact that you have an anion gap present. 
In summary, the delta delta tells you if there are two primary metabolic events occurring at the same time. There are calculations that you could use to calculate the delta delta, but I prefer to use the eyeball approach and ask the question, based on what the size of the anion gap is, is the bicarb equal to, higher, or lower than what I would expect? Here's an example of a sneaky, tricky, hit below the belt example. A completely normal ABG. Can we stop our analysis here? The answer is no. What if the anion gap was 20, which represents an increase of 8? If that was true, we would expect the bicarb to be down by 8 and be 16. But the bicarb is higher than we expect. Therefore, this is an example of an anion gap metabolic acidosis plus a metabolic alkalosis, and the amount of the metabolic acidosis is exactly equal to the amount of the metabolic alkalosis, so they balanced each other off and produced a totally normal bicarb, but the anion gap still persisted, and that's the clue there's something very seriously wrong in this blood gas. So this blood gas looks completely normal on the surface. And if we do not do a complete analysis of all the details, we're going to make a mistake. And the message is, you must complete all the steps of the ABG analysis in order to get an accurate result. In part one of our presentation series, we defined what emia means, and that acidemia means acid in the blood, and alkalemia means alkali in the blood. In this case, the pH is normal, so there is no acidemia and there is no alkalemia. But there are two processes going on, an acidosis process and an alkalosis process that balanced each other off. So we have alkalosis and acidosis without acidemia or alkalemia. Here's a summary of all the steps required for a complete ABG analysis. Step 1. Is acidemia or alkalemia present? Step 2. Is the primary disorder respiratory or metabolic or perhaps both? Step 3. Is it compensated? And if it is, is it partial or complete? Step 4. Does it appear to be overcompensated? If yes, there will be two opposing primary processes. Step 5. Is an anion gap present? If yes, there will always be an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And step 6. Is a delta delta present? If yes, there will always be two metabolic processes. And note, we put two kidneys beside step number 6 because both of these processes would be metabolic, whereas steps 2 and 4 are a mixture of respiratory and metabolic. We're finished the delta delta, and we only have to do the differential diagnoses. We have a few slides left, and then the presentation will be finished. The differential diagnosis for anion gap metabolic acidosis always requires that a new acid is present in the body. The acronym MUD piles might help you remember these causes. M stands for methanol, which is a poisonous alcohol that used to be created when people distilled bad moonshine. U stands for uremia, which is increased urea in patients with renal failure. D stands for DKA, which stands for diabetic, ketoacidosis, and the presence of ketones generates an acid. The P and the I are very rare and represent peraldehyde ingestion and iron overload or isoniazid poisoning, and I'm not going to spend any time on those. L stands for lactate, and this is probably the most common cause of an anion gap metabolic acidosis and a lactic acidosis or lactic acid 
is the same thing. E stands for ethanol, which is regular drinking alcohol, but this also includes poisonous alcohols like ethylene glycol or isopropyl alcohol. And yes, going to the bar and having a few drinks will give you an anion gap metabolic acidosis. And the S stands for salicylates, such as aspirin. And these can cause a very profound, very serious anion gap metabolic acidosis. The differential diagnosis for a non-anion gap acidosis requires that the chloride increases and the bicarb decreases. Addition of normal saline through the intravenous is the most common cause of a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Direct loss of bicarb through the GI or GU systems, either diarrhea or renal losses, will also result in a non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. In all cases, the chloride and the bicarb buffer or balance each other out so that the sum of the chloride and the bicarb stays the same so that there is no increase in the calculated anion gap and there is no new acid being introduced into the body. Usually, a non-anion gap acidosis is not as bad or dangerous as a anion gap acidosis. Causes of metabolic alkalosis can be categorized into chloride responsive and chloride resistant. Chloride responsive have a low urine chloride and are very common. Dehydration from any cause, hypokalemia from any cause, use of diuretics, which essentially is dehydration and hypokalemia, and vomiting, which is a combination of dehydration and directly losing gastric acid. The chloride resistant causes are very uncommon and they have a high urine chloride. Barter's syndrome and Gittleman syndrome both cause mutations that mimic getting a diuretic. Hyperaldosteronism will cause a metabolic alkalosis and Little syndrome mimics too much aldosterone and also causes metabolic alkalosis. In clinical practice, the chloride responsive causes will probably occur more than 95% of the time. And the chloride resistant causes are very good to know for exams. Causes of respiratory acidosis are the exact same as the causes for hypoventilation, resulting in low minute ventilation. A low respiratory rate will cause a low minute ventilation. Sedating medications such as narcotics or benzodiazepines or brain injury to the respiratory center of the brain will cause a low respiratory rate. A low tidal volume can also cause a low minute ventilation. Intrinsic lung disease such as infection, inflammation, heart failure, or fibrosis can do this. Airway problems such as a foreign body or asthma or COPD. Neuromuscular weakness, which makes it difficult for the patient to move air in and out. And a chest wall deformity also will make it difficult to move air in and out. Causes of a respiratory alkalosis are the same as the causes of hyperventilation, resulting in a high minute ventilation. This can be accomplished either through an increase in the respiratory rate or the tidal volume. A brain injury where there is blood in or around the brain creates an acidic environment and causes the brain to hyperventilate. Pain, anxiety, or panic will also cause somebody to hyperventilate. We have now finished all topics in the arterial blood gas presentation series. It's possible that you might be feeling a bit overwhelmed with all this information, and it's important to point out that ABG analysis is a skill. Skill development requires practice and feedback. This podcast series only provides you with information, but does not 
provide you with the practice and feedback required to develop your skill. The next step for you is to practice, practice, practice so that you can earn your diagnostic skills.